Thanks everybody for joining me today. I'm going to talk about um, which uh, balancing product needs with open source objectives. Um, a lot of us find ourselves balancing product needs with open source project obje objectives to be challenging. And if you do, like me, if you do, um, uh, you're not alone. Uh, a, lot, a lot of us uh, at times when we are working for companies that we have a product time to market needs, and then we are looking to see, do you also want to contribute and make our product part of the um, any open source project? I'm going to be speaking with the, uh, the Linux kernel because that's <clears throat> the open source project I'm most familiar with. And then I'm going to share my experiences having to balance product needs in uh, my previous roles at a couple of other companies and um, it, with the Linux kernel um, project objectives. So navigating open source and co co corporate cultural differences and then objectives and goals as well. These roles have different goals and different objectives. That's what makes it challenging in, in a lot of different ways. It's a delicate balance very often. It is easier to work exclusively on either side of this divide. Um, like I do currently, I don't uh, work for an organi uh, organization that has a product. Um, uh, so my focus currently uh, can be easier in some, in some ways being um, just upstream focus. In the past, I, when I worked for companies that have products based on Linux kernel, at that point, I had to learn to balance um, uh, balance the needs of the product that I am working on, um, and as well as um, what would be beneficial to upstream. So that's kind of what we are going to talk about. A lot of the um, a lot of what I'm going to share is coming from my experience um, doing this. So it does require a lot of uh, delicate uh, finesse and skill to know which hat you want to wear. When you, are you representing at any point in time, uh, are you representing the product um, teams or are you representing the upstream? And also keeping in mind that you are looking to uh, be productive in your both roles um, and bring value to both sides. So today um, I'm going to uh, walk through upstream mindset and the importance to do your homework before you go to upstream with an idea and also balancing what does it really mean to do the balancing act? And then how do you, the best practices and how can you bridge between two worlds? As you know, you might, some of you might know upstream releases are time-based, not feature-based. So that I find is the big difference between the two worlds that causes um, a lot of the challenges or leads to a lot of challenges. When I say upstream is uh, releases are time-based and not feature-based, meaning what, what do I mean by that? Um, Linux kernel releases come out once every eight to 10 weeks. And um, each release has a two week merge window uh, for new features. So Linux kernel development is a continuous uh, development model where uh, development is happening while integration uh, is happening, meaning developers are getting ready for the next release while we are integrating the features that came into the through the merge window, right? The two weeks merge window. Um, there's a six to eight weeks of fixing bugs and regressions and integrating all these new features with the existing kernel base, code base. So all of, while all of that is happening, people are planning for future releases. So that is a continuous development model um, 
unlike maybe in a product world, you might go through a period of design and de uh, development, and then and and then you add those features and then integrate. So while a separate group of people might be working on older releases, so and then at the same and and also when in a product world when you are thinking about next release you are deciding the features first you are saying okay my, our our next release will have this this feature this feature a feature b feature c and you're working towards that whereas um upstream releases are time based if a feature is not ready to make the cut for the merge window then that feature will be uh will be in the next release which will come three months from now so that's the big difference so another thing to keep in mind is all fixes must go into mainline first right so we'll talk a little bit about the stable releases in the, on the next slide um, so you can find um, a lot of the information i'm uh, about working with the kernel development community in the kernel documentation um, i'm leaving you with a link here to read. So the development process that we use in upstream kind of also leads to the mindset of upstream developers. We are more focused on whether a feature is not ready or not um, uh, when the time for merge window comes. So uh, we know that if the feature is not ready, it can go into the next release and we'll have more time to, to make changes to it. So that's the mindset we are working with. And we are also working with the mindset that fixes going into the mainline, um, mainline um, get applied to stable release. So we are thinking about, well, uh, if uh, we fix, we have a uh, fix, um, do we, can we, um, fixes, okay, fixes can go in at any time into the mainline, right? Um, but it, they have to go into the mainline first. And then some of the, uh, we select um, fixes for, uh, selection of fixes uh, for stables is automated. It's automated, and then they get selected automatically. We attempt to apply these fixes automatically first. And if the auto apply fails, porting is requested. And at times though, the auto automated tools do find a good chunk of fixes. However, manual uh, selection is also necessary um, to have the fixes going to stables. And um, can be marked for, um, fixes can also be marked for stable releases with the stable tax. You can see all about everything you want to know about in this document document on the in the kernel git everything you ever wanted to know about like stable releases you can check that and see how that works so continuing on the upstream mindset um we um some re stable releases are all tagged for long term as well so long term updates, um, stable releases, get fixes and security updates and so on. Still keeping in mind all the fixes first going to the main line, which is when I say main line, um, if this is um, the Linux uh, master Git. Upstream, so another thing to keep in mind is if you are a product, if you are um, trying to balance product needs with the upstream needs, you want to keep in mind that upstream developers uh, community might not know about your product needs and might not care about your product needs, um, your deadlines or time to market needs or features even. Um, upstream cares about features that add value and the upstream community will be reluctant to take features that aren't ready. Uh, meaning you might have a deadline saying, I need to get this in by um, this uh, June 2021, for example. But however, um, 
if it's not ready, it won't make it into, uh, if the upstream community doesn't think it's ready, it won't make it into the release. So you have to keep that in mind definitely as you are doing this uh, balancing act of upstream and product. So a few things, uh, this, any questions? Do we have any questions, Christina? I don't see any so far, but just a reminder, you can add them here in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you if you'd like to ask a question live. Okay, great. So, um, so, do, so, so what does it mean when you are thinking about product and you're thinking, okay, I have this design, I want to have these features in my product by this time. So do your homework. That's really important. Uh, research related um, upstream features. So the, this, uh, all of the things that I'm talking about aren't necessarily applicable, uh, just don't just apply to product development, balancing. It's, these are true for anybody that's wanting to contribute. It's just that the, if you are also responsible for a product that adds more challenges. So um, anytime you have an idea, um, research uh, related upstream features, and that is a very important first step. You might find that there is a feature that you can leverage or there is, um, uh, there is and then also enhance that existing feature as opposed to um, writing um, and reinventing the wheel, right? Don't want to reinvent the wheel. Leveraging and enhancing existing features benefits um, everybody that is dependent on that feature or using that feature currently. When a new feature um, when you think of an idea for a new feature, make sure that that is works well within the existing framework as well. Uh, it is important to design new features to work with the existing framework. For example, you might have you might be adding a um, architecture dependent uh, feature potentially. Then you will have to work within the framework to see how best you can make that. Um, architecture dependent feature um, fit into the rest of the um, kernel infrastructure because uh, the kernel, so kernel supports 33 plus architectures. So the kernel um, has uh, generic areas. The, it is very well partitioned in terms of architecture dependent code and architecture independent code. Very often when you're adding a new feature that might have uh, might support a new hardware, you'll have to think about how well it works on all architectures, especially drivers. Does the driver, um, is, uh, does it have uh, architecture specific components or um, a subsystem might architecture that um, independent component. You have to kind of look at that and then see how well it fits into the um, kernel, existing kernel infrastructure and framework. So more on doing your homework. Um, ask yourself very often, why are you making this change? And this is important to even just explain to the upstream community what you're doing. Um, this is important um, also because of the remote nature of the development. You have to um, explain that in your um, patch um, documentation that goes along with the patch. And when you are explaining um, what a single patch does, and then also if it involves more than one patch, what the patch series does. Um, if you are proposing changes to the existing feature, um, you have to make sure that um, you are not in any way regressing that feature. Um, if you are proposing a new feature, like I said earlier, you have to think about how it, it fits into the rest of the kernel existing features and how inter it interacts with other features. The challenge, um, if you are an independent uh, contributor or 
focusing just on upstream, you don't as much need to worry about um, time constraints, right? So you are kind of, um, you are focused on, okay, I want to um, make this right. I want to contribute something that everybody agrees upon. And then, and you, you have the luxury to take your time. However, when you are working, um, working to get a release out, product release out, um, you, you have other time constraints. And it requires planning. You have to think about it um, and keep the releases, kernel releases in mind, be in sync with those to see um, how best you can uh, plan. And if you are, uh, you also have to plan based on all the questions you already asked yourself, um, are you proposing a, a changes to an existing feature that might be easier uh, time-wise? It might take less time for that to be accepted by the upstream community. If it's a new feature, it might take longer. If, if it is a new driver um, that is independent of, um, it doesn't have in interactions or um, impact on other modules, uh, it might be easier again. So you have to, th that all requires planning. Think about that and then plan. Also keep in mind, keeping in mind at the same time that uh, uh, benefits of upstreaming your uh, code comes in later in the form of collaboration. You, you are recruiting the um, rest of the community to help with um, making enhancements. Um, and then also testing, you're leveraging a lot of the extended um, uh, talent out there. So you have to keep that in mind as well. What, what's in it for you uh, from that angle? So when, um, when you are thinking about um, contributing, um, also keeping your extreme, upstream hat on, you look at is the solution and feature generic enough for upstream? Um, how does your work help upstream? Does it add new functionality? Does it improve performance or security? Does it harden the code base? And and so on. Is there a better? Is there an important question to ask? Is is there a better way to do what you uh, are setting out to do? Would you take this solution? Another important question to ask is, would you take the solution as an upstream developer um, if somebody else proposes it? Any questions? This is another um, time I can take some questions. No questions yet. Okay. So um, what does it mean? So when you have your product hat on, um, so some, one of the reasons you would reach out to make changes to the upstream, set out to make changes to the upstream. You would make changes because upstream doesn't work on your platform. Um, hardware, firmware deviates from a standard, say. You have to do things a little bit differently. Uh, your, your, I mean, your product hardware. Um, new feature or enhancements on an existing one anchors your product. That means it's very important to your product. So another, with all of this, keeping all of these in mind, um, can you also decide, also have to think about, can you talk about your hardware firmware differences? Can you share, uh, what can you share freely, what you cannot share, um, or cannot share or discuss? Um, it's, also, it's very important to, from both sides, you don't want to share something that you don't want to share. You want to, um, it is important also to share um, so that your solution is accepted. So you have to walk that fine line of sharing what's necessary and, um, and not um, giving the store away. You have to find a way to discuss um, the details in a generic way. So now comes, so in all of this brings us to the balancing act. 
so a couple of things to keep in mind that upstream don't, don't if you expect upstream to take your solution as is then you are uh, setting yourself up for disappointment um, it's not a guarantee at all um, it's very often even a small patch would require um, you even when even when you send a small patch in expect that somebody might uh, come up with a different way of doing things or point out something that you haven't thought about. So keep that in mind. Um, when you are uh, proposing a enhancement to an existing feature or a new feature, it is a good idea to discuss uh, the, uh, what you're planning to do at, with upstream at conferences. And um, it, that's probably one of the propose a conference talk and talk about it and see what how well uh, upstream reacts to it. So that's that gives you a good indicator on what you need to change upfront or what you would be. Um, so whether your solution will work as is or re the refinements you have to make or changes you have to make, you might get a uh, feel for that by discussing early on. Um, another thing to keep in mind is collaborating and sharing early. Um, sharing, uh, collaborating and sharing early at conferences and sharing ideas and discussing um, it will, is, is going to make it easier uh, for your uh, feature uh, to be, the time for accepting time uh, can be shorter depending on, depending on, uh, depending on the refinements you need to make, right? So it's always um, beneficial to collaborate, start collaboration and sharing early. Another thing that would benefit the product is um, adapting, it might or might not be possible. However, it would be beneficial to adapt upstream first rule, meaning upstreaming, um, having the um, feature upstream first and then um, getting it into the product. That will that will be beneficial long run. So you don't have to um, to go out with a different solution than the one that upstream accepts, and then you have you might end up um, maintaining two different core bases, or you might end up changing the product um, after its release to uh, update it with the uh, version that's upstream has accepted. So it might be difficult to do later, later on. It is also important to keep upstream variations to a small percentage. Um, you, this could happen in as it, you might, even if you started upstream first, as you are fixing bugs or as you are finding problems that need to, to be fixed, if you don't keep up with the upstream, it might um, become difficult to keep them in sync. So you have to dis you have to first decide how often to merge upstream because merging upstream, um, you have to validate your product, of course, right? Because upstream brings changes. It changes that could impact your um, product support. So you have to, to figure out or decide what's the optimal um, merge points are for your upstream and frequent is better. Um, uh, that's the best solution to do. Because, um, because upstream, um, you're, you, you might see some regressions, but you're also seeing uh, improvements, right? Continuous security updates, continuous uh, fixes. So um, upstream, uh, keeping up with upstream and merging frequently is necessary to for the health of the product. So keeping track of, um, with that in mind, you have to keep track of stable and uh, long-term releases um, to, 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 for two different things. So um, many products, um, release, many products choose a uh, long-term release as their base for release 
and then they keep taking uh, security updates. Um, as new stables come in, uh, fixes, um, they keep um, moving to the recent table, uh, latest stable release for that long-term release. So you, you it, this is all, again, uh, you have to kind of decide um, what happens if you don't hit that target? What happens if um, contingency plan if it doesn't? And then if the contingency plan is released and then um, uh, make it part of upstream, then you are balancing the act of what if your, um, the pro your feature doesn't make it as you expected uh, in the same um, shape or form into upstream. So you might have to make changes to product as well as upstream. Let's talk a little bit about bridging um, between the two worlds. Um, explaining, so you, as a upstream developer that's also focused on product development, if you are straddling those two um, worlds, um, then you are um, doing two things. One is you are explaining upstream to product teams and you are um, telling them the benefits and importance of upstream first and paying it forward for benefits and of collaboration with upstream and keeping the delta, the importance of keeping the delta from upstream small. And you're also um, asking them to plan um, you are uh, talking to them about planning ahead and then also bringing that into your product teams, that knowledge into your product teams. And then explaining your feature or change to the, on the other side, you are explaining your feature or change to the upstream, up, upstream community. You are uh, talking to them, upstream community, working with them to um, to meet your product needs. You are, make, you are working to get, you, get the features um, that support your product um, by the upstream community. You want that content in the upstream kernel. So you are continuously talking, communicating what's in it for you uh, message to both sides. Um, so let's let's talk about. We have talked a lot about um, balancing both worlds and then challenges. Now let's talk about a few things to keep in mind. These would be helpful, um, not just uh, for people that are balancing product and then needs and upstream community needs, or straddling that fence of upstream and uh, product. This is um, beneficial to everybody that is contributing to, um, to upstream open source projects. So be open to changing your solution um, or your idea. When you propose a, your idea or a solution, assume that will change and evolve. Uh, don't be locked into your I, first idea, you know, it will change. Be mindful of adding value to both worlds. Um, you know, you, you want to get your product out, you want to get, um, or you want to um, see a feature that you are using maybe perhaps for your, in your um, even if it's not a product, you are just using that feature. Uh, you, you want to uh, uh, think about adding, um, helping yourself and helping others, right? So, um, so that will go a long ways um, before getting your work accepted into the by the community. Be open to be a student and teacher at the same time, um, because there is a lot to learn uh, from the community. There, um, and then you. The, this is a this is a collaborative uh, community with the trust, trust and respect. So leveraging this collective ex expertise of the community um, is going to be beneficial for the project Linux kernel as well as 
um, the rest of the community as well. So also adopting the attitude that I don't know everything is going to help in the long run to, um, to be able to contribute to the com com contribute and work with the community. So finally, um, I'm going to leave you with um, um, a few thoughts. Learn as you go. Um, I find myself learning every day and keep learning. And there is really no textbook that teaches these skills. You just have to, to make mistakes, uh, learn from your mistakes, and then um, learn the balancing act. There is no perfect solution for every product and every scenario. Um, keeping the uh, some of these uh, upstream mindset in mind will help make the balancing act easier. Do we have any questions, Christina? Or we do not, um, but just again, as a reminder to anyone who's joined us recently, you are able to either add a question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your hand and I can alert Shua that you have a question, or you can also just unmute yourself at any time and feel free to um, ask a question or provide any comments. We welcome your participation. So you are welcome to share your thoughts as well if you uh, don't have any questions. And if not, we can wrap this up. Okay, we did get a comment. Daniel said, very thought provoking. Thank you. Great. Want to give it a few more moments? Sure. All right, looks like we have a question from Muhammad. If a Linux kernel maintainer is employed by a company now, how does the community keep him in check that he isn't doing anything in a hurry because of his company's pressure? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, so um, community doesn't have to necessarily keep a maintainer in check. Um, it is all trust and respect, right? Maintainer, um, as a maintainer, even if you are not a maintainer, if you are an active contributor, one thing that you're constantly balancing is, um, it is very important for uh, maintainers to not lose their credibility. If uh, a maintainer, um, doesn't do that balancing act of um, benefit to both worlds, thinking about both upstream, value to upstream and value to product. And if they are um, only thinking about the product, they end up losing credibility in the community. So they become not very really effective. So that in itself is uh, acts as a check and it will help well I mean obviously there there are ways you can if the if there is a if you see a pattern if you see a um, pattern that a maintainer um, he might be abusing um, uh, the uh, trust the community and other developers are placing, then um, there are, they will be 
consequences, of course, right? Not not consequences in, in, in terms of um, in terms of uh, consequences will be in terms of losing credibility. So none of us really want to do that. We want to be part of the community. So does that answer your question? We'll give him a few moments to respond if you'd like, but we did get two more questions in. Okay. Oh, Mohammed said, yes, it does. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so another question we got from Armstrong. He said, thanks for the talk. Uh, what happens to changes like bug fixes, new features, et cetera, that are not integrated into future releases? Uh, you mean that haven't been accepted into the um, by the maintainers? Is that the question? Because most fixes, well, I mean, uh, fixes do get accepted, but are you talking about the ones that don't? Give him a few moments to respond. Um, yes, those that are accepted, he said. So, so I will answer the question in two different ways. So say if you were a fix came in and that isn't accepted, um, has that problem been fixed in a different way? That's one answer to that. If it's still an outstanding problem, then um, the submit, submitted patch submitter can um, resend the patch and say, hey, this is still a problem. And then if it is a stable um, release and there is a fix upstream that hasn't been selected by auto uh, fixes, auto tools that select fixes, or any manual met, uh, methods, then um, that fix can be sent to upstream, uh, sent to stable, uh, putting a mainline commit ID in the stable, the patch commit log saying, hey, this fix is already in upstream. It's not in the stable release. You can do that. Um, the third possibility possibly is that your product um, has, you have been fixing bugs in the product and that's where the keeping the Delta small comes in. So if you do not upstream the bugs um, that you're finding in your product um, or as your feature that you already upstreamed, then you are accumulating a lot of debt. So you want to keep that Delta small. So that is, three different aspects of the question you asked. Um, if that's not what you have in mind, please ask another question and a follow-up question. Great, we have one more question from Tito. They ask, what advice would you have for students interested in becoming a kernel developer maintainer? Um, so th they, we have, um, um, we have, LF has uh, mentorship programs. Will this is probably a good time to talk about that. Um, so we have um, a mentorship program that's designed to help new developers for ne with necessary skills and resources to experiment, learn, and contribute effectively to open source communities. And then there are other resources available, like the webinars we are doing, of course, and then, um, you can um, join the Cardinal Newbies and check Cardinal Newbies um, website as well as IRC. So what I would say is that the best way to get started is uh, you have multiple ways to get started. You can um, at the beginning, if you, if you have never used Linux Cardinal and if you haven't really played with it on your um, hardware or the first thing to do is um, go and start um, taking beginner classes available. Um, LF Training has a class. Um, I did a class for um, a couple of years ago, uh, primarily to help uh, mentees from in the mentorship program to get started as a, as a screening and then also helping uh, developers that want to um, 
be in a unstructured uh, learning uh, self study it's a it's a linux uh, beginners uh, guide for linux kernel development you can do that you can start that offers a lot of tips and then test stable releases and then other kernel releases as they are coming in that is one of the best ways to to learn and then also find problems so you can either report the problems you can uh, take the time to fix the bugs and another option is um, run uh, tools uh, automated tools com um, compiling kernels with uh, um, warnings turned up, turned up and then you might find problems that way so testing um, gives you avenues for um, or playing with kernels like I call it call playing with kernels gives you opportunities to um, find and fix problems as well We don't have any other further questions. We want to just give it a few more moments in case anyone has anything else. I don't see any other questions. Would you like to go ahead and wrap up, sure? Or we would you like to stay on for? Um, well, we could wrap wrap up. Yeah. Okay. Well. Thank you for your time today and thank you to all of the participants who joined us. Um, as a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today and we will also be sharing the slides um, on our website. We hope you're able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you.